Welcome to another session of Sitting with Dr. Lobezi. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezi. Today we're going to be talking about the characteristics of the Italian Renaissance, why it began in Italy, and then uh, the politics of the Italian city-states. So the term Renaissance means rebirth of antiquity, uh, rebirth of art and learning of antiquity. And so when we say antiquity, we refer to the classics. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, that's uh, the ancient Greece uh, or ancient Greek and Rome civilizations. Um, we put the time period right about 1350. So it's on the heels of the bubonic plague. Um, and its birthplace is in Florence, Italy, as pictured in the, uh, the picture to the right. That's Il Duomo, Santa Maria del Fiore. And the man featured in that uh, picture is none other than Jacob Burkhart. He was the Swiss historian who first sort of coined the phrase um, Italian Renaissance. So roughly around 1860. Some of the characteristics deal with uh, or the themes, uh, classicism. Uh, humanism, individualism, secularism. Um, so anything where we're talking about the, the revival of the classics, obviously, or in antiquity, that's classicism. And the de development of human talents, that's humanism. Celebration of individual achievement uh, is not just uh, individualism, but it's a little humanism as well. So with these themes, they're not, um, it's not without some overlap. Um, secularism is probably, along with humanism, the two largest themes, and this deals with uh, non-religious or worldly pursuits. We'll talk a little bit more about secularism as uh, we go on and, and kind of um, bolster or add to that definition. Um, so the one thing that we want to note here about the Renaissance is that it was not a dramatic uh, shift from the Middle Ages, but it does demark the beginning of the modern age. So it was more of a gradual change. And it wasn't something that was a large movement. It was sort of restricted to the uh, elites of um, Italian society. Uh, what we see featured in uh, the artwork is something called realism this desire to depict things as they really are. Um, so there are going to be some artistic uh, techniques that we'll be discussing in a later video that kind of allows the uh, artists to, uh, to make things appear more realistic. And then we also will talk about in another video, uh, realism in literature. Uh, and so that was a, uh, uh, something important uh, to the authors of this time period. Okay. And so, the last uh, theme that we want to discuss is activism. And of course, activism is this, it, 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 this notion that it became popular to um, bring about um, change uh, and, and to take an active role in improving the quality of life, not just for yourself, but for all. So people become very civically minded and uh, want to use their education and sort of the uh, education provided by the uh, ancient classic author, classical authors to help bring that about, okay? Um, so the goal to another idea that is uh, very popular with the Italian Renaissance is this notion that you want to be a well-rounded individual, meaning you want to be uh, skilled in, in many different areas. So the term universal man, Renaissance man, uh, sort of is a synonymous term. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about with the characteristics. So moving on to uh, the idea that we are entering a new age. So what we're going to have to do is sort of talk about the Middle Ages and the medieval mindset and talk about how uh, we begin to see a, a change to something more modern. Okay. So um, Typically, during the Middle Ages, uh, th there was very little sense of one's self or ego. Um, people, individual people and their accomplishments were certainly de-emphasized. And why is that? Uh, because people believed that, you know, uh, their time here on Earth was temporary. And since it was temporary, 
they should uh, get about the business of uh, uh, making sure that they gain salvation. Okay, and so people, because they lacked education, um, were sort of preoccupied with this uh, idea of trying to get their souls ready uh, for heaven. And so they were also superstitious. And what I mean by that is uh, felt that certain um, things, if, if they were to become distracted, might uh, anger God and, and God might punish them or, or curse them. Certainly that was the thought process that we've kind of already discussed uh, with regards to the bubonic plague, the idea that God is, you know, responsible for visiting this, uh, this, you know, scourge onto mankind because, you know, it's sinfulness or something like that. And so people uh, wanted to be very focused on readying their souls for salvation, for the next life. And so the way they, they viewed their own experience here on earth was, you know, if they suffered, uh, if they had uh, challenges and adversity, that's because that's what God wanted. And, you know, God was sort of uh, testing their faith. And so they, they shouldn't try to do anything to improve their lot in life uh, because they could they could risk, you know, God's punishment. So that was uh, a big, important uh, belief system during the Middle Ages. And we start to get away from that. OK, so uh, in the middle of the 14th century, um, that mindset begins to change, okay? And people begin to focus on the here and now, uh, ways to uh, even not, not just improve the quality of life uh, at the time period, but also to... So the next topic that we'll discuss is uh, why the Renaissance begins uh, in Italy. And so pretty much reason number one, what we see here is the uh, uh, Colosseum uh, located in Rome. Uh, and so the idea that, you know, there were reminders in Rome and throughout Italy uh, of the ancient civilization sort of, you know, serves as uh, reminders. And so when people become fascinated with uh, classical culture, uh, it sort of stands the reason that it, it would begin, that it would begin in Italy. So uh, this here is the uh, Parthenon or excuse me, the Pantheon located in Rome as well. And this was sort of the Hall of Gods and um, a very impressive structure. So again, you know, things like that, there were reminders throughout the city of Rome and, you know, as I said, in other parts of Italy as well. So that sort of makes sense. Uh, when we look at the uh, Roman Empire, it's a good idea. I mean, when we talk about it, it's a good idea to see a map just to kind of get an idea that we're not just talking about the city of Rome or even uh, the Italian peninsula, but uh, a good deal of Western Europe, uh, North Africa, and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, including a large uh, swath of the, uh, of the uh, Middle East right here. So this was sort of Rome at its height. Um, uh, the Roman Empire uh, lasted until 476 AD. Uh, and then when it collapsed uh, due to um, uh, Germanic raiders, uh, Germanic invasions, for the most part, 476 comes along. What we see is that uh, the eastern portion of the Roman Empire uh, survives, okay? And that's going to, uh, from 500 on, it's going to carry a different name, and we're going to refer to that as the Byzantine Empire or uh, Eastern Roman Empire, and its capital um, is Constantinople. Constantinople is a, an important uh, city. Uh, it's a, sort of a trade network uh, for the uh, re-emergent trade coming from the Silk Road, you know, China and Asia. Uh, a lot of goods pass through here, um, and it's also a waterway. There's a waterway. It's called the Bosporus Straits. So, again, very important city. Um, and the Byzantine Empire is going to last until uh, 1453 when it, uh, it collapses. It's due to invasions um, by the, uh, the Ottoman Turks, okay? And so that was a, uh, a big deal. Um, so when that took place, a lot of the, uh, I guess, Greek scholars brought a lot of ancient Greek uh, manuscripts with them. 
and fled to uh, Rome for for safety because they they feared the the Ottoman Turks. Okay, and so when that happened, and even before, um, you know, slowly Greek documents and Greek ancient Greek uh, manuscripts are being reintroduced, and many of them had been lost or believed to have been lost during the Middle Ages, and so there's this rediscovery of that as well. So. Um, this is a big part of, you know, the reason why, um, because they, they came to Rome, uh, that the, that Italy is the, the birthplace of the Renaissance. Um, so here's a map of the Ottoman Empire and we see, um, Constantinople, um, right here. It's going to change its name to Istanbul. Um, but what we see is over the years, um, the Ottoman Empire is going to move, uh, very far up into, uh, Southeastern um europe and uh two times they're going to lay siege to um the um to vienna uh it's worth noting also that uh another reason that um the renaissance begins in italy is because um the peninsula sort of sticks out in the middle of the um mediterranean and there were a number of uh, merchants, hundreds of merchants from various cities, primarily Genoa and Venice, uh, that conducted trade uh, with uh, their, you know, Asian uh, counterparts. And, and they're the ones who are going to, in large part, um, they, along with the Catholic Church, uh, are the ones that are going to be responsible for funding the Renaissance, and so um, the, the trade is is very important because without the wealth that comes from the trade, those merchant families would not uh, be funding or patronizing the arts. So, uh, Italy's location, you know, uh, in in the middle of the Mediterranean, sort of made it uh, a natural choice to be involved in uh, overseas trade, uh, and that's just exactly what I'm talking about here. So you can see. Uh, the peninsula as it as it sticks out into the uh, Mediterranean. Okay, uh, moving on. the The next thing I want to talk about are some of the uh, uh, the powers that existed, or the 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 movers and the shakers. The you know the 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 areas in the Italian Renaissance or in Italy that are uh, significant. So, first thing we want to talk about is the fact that Italy is not unified, and it's not going to be unified until the eighteen sixties. Um, but rather, and, and there are a number of uh, nation states sort of um, already in existence. And so Italy is going to be very uh, kind of late to becoming unified. But rather than being unified, it was divided into a number of, especially in the north, uh, Italian city-states. And uh, many of these things were known as communes or sworn associations of free men who sort of um, uh, declared their independence from declared their independence from uh, local nobles okay and so when the rest of Europe was still feudal um, Italy was not and and so the the reason for that is most of the people lived in cities so um, you know that they, they were very urban in nature as opposed to being rural and that's the whole idea of feudalism anyway is that um, uh, there wasn't safety in the cities of Europe and so they hollowed out and people went to the countryside and sort of you know sought protection from uh, from landed gentry or aristocrats but it's it's different okay and uh, what's interesting though is as more and more wealth is centered in the Italian cities in those urban areas. A lot of the nobles, uh, not wanting to kind of be left out, uh, decided that they would marry into the families of uh, these merchant families. And so we see this new sort of uh, oligarchy uh, or oligarchies emerge, these powerful families. Uh, and so there's the blending of the merchant class and the nobility. Okay, so that's something that's new but um we'll talk about um the the form of government that existed so i mentioned oligarchies and so that's you know typically when you have a, a series of wealthy uh, families sort of dominate the political scene uh, there was a 
a group of people known as the Popolo. These are people who were, you know, essentially the commoners. And um, because citizenship rights to be involved in the government were tied to owning property, uh, they sort of rebelled. And the result was the creation of Republican governments. And this is important because this is a, not a common feature at this time period. It's not going to be until, you know, the United States, uh, is, you know, the first modern country to sort of experiment with that form of government. But Republican, it's, you know, it's, it's a form of self-rule, but, uh, you know, power rests in the hands of the, the people. But uh, instead of they got themselves governing, they elect people or representatives to sort of uh, govern on their behalf. So anyway, uh, most of the northern um, Italian city-states have this form of government at least for a while um, so in some instances the power goes back to the hands of the oligarchies uh, but because they didn't want to deal with more uprisings or rebellions from those popolo they at least made it appear as if um, republican type governments existed in those uh, northern Italian city-states. So the ones that we want to talk about are Venice, uh, Milan, and Florence. Okay, so those are the three dominant um, Italian city-states. Of course, you can sh uh, throw Genoa in there as well. But here we have Milan, here's uh, Venice, here's Genoa, here's Florence. Okay, and again, Florence is the birthplace of the, uh, the Renaissance. Uh, when we talk about the Papal States, uh, with Rome being the capital there, this is the territory that the uh, that the Pope governs. And so the Pope is not only the head of the Catholic Church, but he is also a secular leader of the Papal States. And then uh, the Kingdom of Naples to the south. So um, the thing about Venice that I want to mention is you know they're a republican name but they had uh, an oligarchy in the the family um that or the the ruler rather was uh took the title of doge and that was something that was a title given um for life but what's interesting is the men who were selected to be the doge and it's sort of like a it's not a monarch uh it's not a dictator because a monarch is you know royalty a dictator is somebody who, you know, uses the power of the army to seize, but it is, you know, um, it is a, a single leader who uh, dominates the political scene. So they're known as a doge. They do have uh, the right to kind of pass uh, things off to their to their sons, uh, but typically they were elected for the most part. Um, but What's interesting is when they were selected, they were usually in in the you know the last decades of their life, so much older, seventy years old. And the reason being is they wanted somebody who was very wise, but then somebody who would be very uh, politically conservative, somebody who doesn't want to uh, do anything too radically different to usher in radical change. And so that, you know, the idea there is uh, stability. And so the Doge, sort of an older, wise man, you know, would, would kind of uh, maintain that stability. And so that's something that's important. Um, so Milan was um, also another important uh, city-state and the Sforza family were the ones who uh, governed that. And then to the south is the kingdom of Naples. And so this, uh, because Naples is not very urban, it's still pretty rural. So the tradition of feudalism sort of exists still. So it's it's not just the kingdom of Naples, but Sicily as well. And um, it's the king of Aragon who dominates these two uh, regions. So where's Aragon? Aragon's a region in Spain. Okay, so... Uh, the king of Aragon was also the king of Naples, so this guy, Alfonso the Magnanimous. Magnanimous just simply means, uh, it's a characteristic, it's an adjective to describe somebody who is very forgiving, um, very virtuous as a leader, uh, something that when we get into and talk about um, Machiavelli, 
he he would not um, recommend that a leader be magnanimous um, necessarily because uh, that could create some challenges. And that's something that we'll save for another video when we get to it. Um, so, but when we talk about Florence, there's uh, one family that's very important that we'll we'll talk about. And they're the uh, the Medici, Cosimo de Medici, or Medici, and then his son Lorenzo the Magnificent. Uh, so Cosimo is at the top, and Lorenzo uh, is at uh, the picture in the bottom there. Um, so these were uh, the leaders of the family, and they were the sort of the top top of the oligarchy, and so they more or less dominated Florence. Maybe not officially sort of behind the scenes because they wanted to give the illusion that Florence was a uh, uh, was a um, republic but these uh, the Medici were wealthy um, because they were involved in banking so it's not so much overseas trade as it is banking okay so uh, we'll talk about banking at a later time but um, uh, for a long period of time, uh, banking was sort of illegal, okay? Uh, that wasn't anything, uh, but but because of the Medici influence, uh, they were able to, when I say illegal, it was the Catholic Church sort of uh, shunned that and, and said that that was not uh, ethical or honorable or even moral to be involved in that. But that's really for a separate conversation, and we'll do that at a later time. But uh, the other thing about the Medici is they are the ones probably more so than any family, at, you know, the, they're most well known for funding the arts. So a lot of the artwork that we'll discuss in, in a later video will be funded um, by the Medici family. So they're patrons, patrons of the arts. Um, and then we talk about the uh, papal states dominated by the popes. And during the Renaissance, the popes are not really good figures. Uh, they, they're very secular. Uh, and so when we say worldly, we mean uh, also sort of morally corrupt, um, not men who uh, were actually at one time clergy members. They are dominant uh, Italians and they are selected to make Rome and the Papal States more powerful. So they are picking men who are not members of the clergy to run the Catholic Church, especially during this time period during the Renaissance. Okay, so this is going to lead to also in a later video some of the uh, the corruption within the Catholic Church. Uh, and, you know, when we get into the Protestant Reformation, a lot of that's going to be revealed. But part of it is that the popes were not clergy members like priests. And so they were not required to take the same types of vows. And so morally they were corrupt, uh, to say the least. Uh, something else that um, Italy is important, you know, to discuss uh, equality is that modern politics or modern diplomacy has sort of developed here. And um, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, a balance of power. And so this is sort of a um, technique used by countries, but starting with the Italian city-states as a way to prevent one from dominating the others and taking over. And so there were some shifting alliances simply to prevent one or one city-state from becoming more, uh, more powerful than the other. But the two primary uh, alliance systems that existed were Milan, Florence, and Naples versus Venice and the, uh, the Papal States. Okay. And, you know, unfortunately, it was not possible for one of those Italian city-states to become the dominant force because it's likely that there would have been uh, unification that had taken place. And that unification probably would have made uh, warfare, internal warfare, less of an issue because they have a whole lot of foreign influence uh, because of this and, uh, you know, because they're vulnerable to attack by outsiders. So it's a big mess uh, for the continent of your uh, Italy for not the continent, the, the peninsula, excuse me. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, there was the influx of the French, okay, uh, in 1494. And that was due to um, an agreement between Florence and Naples to sort of um, uh, take over Milan. And Milan called on France for support. And so Charles VIII comes down 
uh, brings 30,000 men and invades Italy, okay, uh, from multiple different point, uh, points. And um, so when they invaded uh, Florence in uh, 1494, there was this uh, Dominican friar who sort of said that this was the case. Um, Florence and Italy was being overtaken by outsiders or by foreigners because of its sinfulness, okay? So this idea that there was uh, moral corruption amongst the Italians, and this is the reason God was allowing this to happen, um, or maybe even God was causing it to happen. It doesn't really matter, but the point is, Girolamo Savonarola, this Dominican friar, uh, seizes on this uh, event of the invasion of the French to um, sort of elevate himself um, to a position of leadership. And so he, he sort of becomes a theocrat, you know, uh, a religious leader of Florence for the time being. And so his focus is on, you know, that people should live very austere lifestyles. And what is austere? Uh, I mean, it's the opposite of being secular. It's the opposite of being materialistic. Um, you know, it, it, one of the late medieval writers, Christine de Pizon, um, talks, no, not her, Catherine of Siena, excuse me. Catherine of Siena talks about the uh, difficulty a person has in getting into heaven if they have too many material possessions. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's central. I mean, that that kind of idea that you can't uh, gain salvation if you if you have too many worldly distractions. That's a central tenet to Catholicism and Christianity at large, even today. Uh, so Ger Girolamo Savonarola, he's not really seizing on anything that's like unique, but that seems to be his message. And he's telling uh italians that they need to sort of because they're becoming very wealthy too i mean florence is is benefiting um from trade okay you know and uh when we talk about the renaissance in general you know what is it on the heels of it's on the heels of the bubonic plague and what happened during the bubonic plague uh or what what are the uh, economic effects prices go down wages go up so the standard of living uh is is greater and because of trade, there's even more money injected into, uh, you know, Florence and the rest of Italy for that matter. And so the standard of living just continues to go up and up and up. And people are buying more and more, uh, uh, you know, luxury items or consumer goods. And so they're becoming preoccupied with their worldly possessions. And, and so Savonarola is railing against that and giving these fiery sermons and telling people that, you know, unless they change their ways... Um, you know, th they're going to have uh, more and more, you know, troubles and that if they do change their ways, then Florence will become this great uh, power and it may even unite all of Italy. Um, and so one of the things that he's most, um, I guess, notorious for was he called on uh, the people of Florence to take all of their uh, worldly possessions and, um, and burn them and, and get rid of them. Uh, because Florence was known for having lots of festivals and things like that. And uh, he changed or replaced those festivals with religious festivals. And during those times, he was encouraging people to get rid of their possessions. And so it's something called the, the Bonfire of the Vanities in 1497. That's what this painting is a subject of. And this, as you can see, um, this artwork here is depicting them actually burning them. So a lot of people got rid of that, okay? And so this is uh, noteworthy, though, because they're burning things. They're burning not just material possessions, but they're also burning books. So that's not going to be, you know, the, the last time in history. So, uh, you know, I guess when Nazi Germany, they, they had book burnings. Uh, there have been uh, other instances where books have been burned. Um, it's interesting, you know, like themes, like little events like that, um, kind of repeat themselves throughout history. So, um, you know, if we, it's, it's always good to be able to draw connections across time and space. So, you know, when, when we get to, uh, the 20th century and we talk about Nazi Germany, 
Um, you know, if one person, if you happen to see an essay on that, you could draw a connection all the way back to Florence in 1497 when they uh, had book burnings as well. Not that they were for the same reason, but, um, you know, the, 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 there, there are some similarities. Anyway, but um, moving on. So what's ironic, though, is that um, he ends up getting excommunicated by the Pope because he's highly critical that the Pope had become too worldly. And so he once he's excommunicated, he sort of learn, loses all of his uh, mojo. And so he's he's replaced. Um, and then the uh, Medici, in fact, come back. But uh, the irony, the great irony is he is burned at the stake at the very place um, where he ordered the bonfire of the vanity. So that's noteworthy. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here is that uh, the Italian peninsula is going to be the battleground for three foreign powers, but really only two uh, competing for control of it. One being France, as I've already mentioned, and then the other are the Spanish. Okay, but um they are linked up because of marriages to the holy roman empire okay and so um and it's really the family that's most important there um the ruling uh, dynasty of both the holy roman empire and spain they're known as the habsburgs okay and so the uh the italian peninsula is going to be in large part the uh the battleground for a long-standing uh, war between uh, the, the the French and the Spanish slash Germans, if you will. So it's known as the Habsburg Valois Wars, and they are going to uh, begin in 1590. Uh, excuse me, 1490, and go all the way. Uh, let's see, into the 1560s, I believe. But uh, we'll, in fact, talk about them at a later time, that conflict, actually, at the end of this chapter. So um, so there's going to be lots of uh, warfare uh, on the horizon for Italy and, you know, violence and chaos, as, uh, et cetera. So thanks for listening and uh, tune in to the next video. And uh, don't forget to hit like and share and make sure you uh, follow and uh, so that you can get uh, just notifications of my next videos. Thanks a lot.